I'm following Carlos, one of our guides, in the last few kilometers of our journey to Machu Picchu. My son Elliot and the rest of the group are just behind me. We've been up since very early today, long before the sun. Below us, shrouded in mist and fog, is our goal, the crown jewel of the once mighty Inca Empire, Machu Picchu. Just beyond the city, Huayna Picchu, the mountain that towers more than 60 stories above the site, juts through the clouds with its steep, jagged slopes. But there is no spectacular view of Machu Picchu on this morning. Carlos explains that there are only a few days of the year where the city can be seen at this time of day. We've been climbing and descending and working and waiting to get to this moment and this place. We want to see what Mr. Hiram Bingham from Yale University saw in 1911 when he first laid eyes on Machu Picchu and became known as the man who discovered it. For more than four tough, wet, sweaty, sleeping on the ground days, we have focused on this moment, hoping that today would be one of those rare, clear, early mornings when the perfect view of one of the seven wonders of the world would spread out before us. Carlos senses our disappointment and assures us that it will be fine. We just need to be patient. The city will reveal itself. The clouds will lift and it will be a beautiful, clear, sunny day. He tells us not to worry. It will be worth the hard work we've all done to reach this point. We will not be disappointed. Carlos epitomizes the attitude of many Peruvians. Don't worry, things will be fine. Take it easy, Mr. John, he says. He is so calm and confident that we can't help but believe him. So we keep moving and we wait. Like most adventures these days, ours starts at an airport. Many airports, in fact, from Omaha, Nebraska, to San Francisco, to San Salvador, to Lima, and then eventually, finally, to Cusco. What started as a phone call from my son on Father's Day has turned into an epic journey of discovery. As we fly high above Peru, the clouds below are occasionally pierced by the peaks of the Andes Mountains. When we finally land in Lima, we settle in for a long night of waiting. Our short final flight to Cusco doesn't take off till early the next morning. Good morning. Welcome to another adventure with John. I say good morning because it's 12.30 a.m. at the Lima International Airport and Elliot and I are just killing time until our 6 a.m. flight to Cusco. So we met a couple from Canada and they had just come back from Machu Picchu and gave us some great tips on uh, how, the, how the, uh, the whole system works there and what the weather's like and everything else. So we'll be sharing some of those things as we go. So we got about uh, six hours that we have to wait for our next flight. So far, been really uneventful, good flights. Everything's been on time, so I'll talk to you soon. 8,500 miles and 48 hours after I left home in Atlantic, Iowa, Elliot and I are picked up at the Cusco Airport by a taxi and taken to our home away from home, the Ninos Hotel. It's a quiet, quaint little hotel whose profits help support a local orphanage. The rooms are neat and tidy, the small restaurant serves excellent and inexpensive food, and there's a colorful and charming courtyard and the doors, well, the doors are incredibly small. We enjoy our time there very much as we explore Cusco, shop for souvenirs, and acclimate to the altitude in preparation for the arduous journey ahead on the Inca Trail. Cusco is a fascinating city full of old world charm, new world aspirations, and third world poverty. The streets are gritty and worn smooth with wear, and they are seldom flat or level. You're either going up or down, it seems, and always on crowded, narrow streets with loud buses and taxis, who seem to know the rules of the road 
even though they're not that obvious to the thousands of travelers and tourists roaming the streets. Incessantly honking horns are a constant reminder to stay on the sidewalks, inches from the street, and watch your back. Dogs are everywhere, and so are street vendors selling their wares. The marketplaces are packed to the rafters with colorful cloth, local produce, baked goods, and handmade articles of all kinds, and at an exchange rate of roughly one dollar to every three soles. The price is right for the bargain hunting tourista. Foreigners and world travelers are everywhere, and the shops and streets are humming with languages from around the globe. Machu Picchu is a bucket list destination for many adventure seekers, and the local economy depends on the travel industry to keep the wheels of commerce rolling. There seems to be a church or temple at every major intersection, and fountains are everywhere. The architecture is a blend of influences from the old Inca temples to the Spanish conqueror's grand and garish cathedrals. The language is mostly Spanish, but many people still speak Quechua, which was the language of the Inca Empire until it was destroyed in the 16th century by the invading Spaniards. Cusco lies in a valley surrounded by steep hills on all sides. The city has crawled its way up many of these slopes, and the commute to work for many people involves walking downhill to the center of town usually carrying goods to be sold at market, then going home straight up. Elliot and I get in some great training on the streets of Cusco for the challenges we will soon face on the Inca Trail. It's little wonder that few natives seem to have any serious weight issues. Life in Cusco can't be easy for most people, and the lean faces tell a story of hard work and long days. On the whole, though, they seem to be a proud and happy people. It seems like every building has an unfinished upper floor, with rebar pointing up into the sky, sometimes covered with bright colored bottles, waiting for the next story to be added with locally made bricks and blocks. Later on, I ask Carlos about the unfinished architecture, and he tells me they just ran out of money. When they get more money, they'll keep building. The night before our real adventure begins, we meet with our two guides, Flavio, the senior guide, and Carlos, his assistant. We meet at the Lama Path Outfitters offices close to our hotel. They go over our itinerary, show us some maps and pictures, but most importantly, we get our first taste of coca tea. This local drink is made with coca leaves, which are said to give a person energy and stamina, as well as acting as an antidote for altitude sickness. It also tastes great. In the days ahead, many of us will also try chewing the leaves as we hike each day, as many of our porters do. Although made from coca leaves, it's a long way off from the end product of the coca plant, cocaine. Flavio tells us about what to expect on our trek, how the porters do their jobs, and what our timeline will be for reaching our destination, Machu Picchu. We discuss pacing, trail etiquette, and the custom of tipping our porters and guides at the end of the trip. He explains that there will be four days of walking, climbing, and occasionally crawling or sliding up and down steep and sometimes dangerous terrain sleeping on the ground in tents, and, most importantly, having the trip of a lifetime. Our trek starts early, very early, before dawn in downtown Cusco. I'm surprised to see a very brand new looking bus pull up in front of our group of 16 travelers ready to pick us up for the ride to the trailhead at kilometer 82. The bus is bright red, the official color of our outfitter, Llama Path. It is covered with the Llama Path logo and is nice and clean inside with comfortable seats. My first impression is there is no way that this bus will fit on these streets, but it does, just barely. 
As we climb out of Cusco for what seems like half an hour, the roads turn from rough, twisty lanes to modern highways and then back to dirt and rock trails. We see the ubiquitous cornfields and houses where the families live upstairs and the livestock downstairs. Corn and potatoes are the cash crop of Peru. Most of the farming is done by hand in small plots, but I spot several tractors along the way. The owners are no doubt quite popular with their neighbors. We stop along the way to pick up our porters, 21 small, lean men who look like they've done this many times before. They're waiting by the side of the road with a couple of smaller vans full of equipment. We stop along the way for a delicious breakfast and admire the cute little guinea pigs kept in hutches behind the restaurant. They are quite a delicacy in Peru, and Elliot is determined to sample one before our trip is over. When we get to the checkpoint to start walking, the porters must each have their packs weighed by a government official. The weight limit is 55 pounds. There are strict rules in place to protect porters so they aren't overworked and taken advantage of. As each pack is weighed, invariably, several articles are taken out to make weight. Once the official is done and returns to his office, I notice each porter returning almost every removed article back into his pack. They don't seem worried about the extra weight. It's obvious that our outfitter does a great job of providing for their porters with the proper gear, clothing, and especially footwear to keep them safe. Their matching red pants, shirts, and huge packs will be a welcome sight to us on the trail in the days ahead. Once out on the trail, we will see many other teams of porters that are not so well equipped. Ours seem to have a great time together, and the camaraderie of the group is obvious. Their job is to carry most of the gear and food, set up camp, help the chef with food preparation, and then tear down camp when we leave each morning. They will stand and clap for us as we leave camp and then go to work. Before long, we hear Porter, Porter, Porter behind us on the trail. We step to one side and let the red train go racing by so they can get ahead of us and do it all over again. We all gather at the trailhead for the obligatory group photo all clean and fresh and shiny, with khaki everywhere. It's a great mix of personalities and nationalities. 16 trekkers, 21 porters, one chef, two guides, and about 1,600 pounds of equipment and food. It's a big group, but we all get along fine, and we encourage each other when the going gets tough, which is all the time. We quickly form a bond of friendship and teamwork that stays with us throughout the trip. I have to say, I've rarely met such an interesting, intelligent, and fun group of people. We all just hit it off right from the start. There were no whiners, complainers, or slackers in our group, and we end up supporting each other every day. Four Americans, two Canadians, one French woman, seven Australians, and two Irish women. Among the group are four married couples, one pair of sisters, and one father-son team, Elliot and I. Ages range from the low 20s and 30s on up, with me being the oldest of the group by some 15 years at age 60. The Aussies were shocked that most Americans get only one or two weeks of vacation each year. One couple was on a three-month walkabout of South America and another would be gone for five months. As we start up the Inca Trail, it doesn't take long to notice how quickly the terrain is changing. At first there are motorcycles and mules on the trail with dogs, kids, and local residents, but soon it's just the hikers and porters. 500 people are permitted on the Inca Trail each day. But we are spread out over 42 kilometers, which is about 26 and a half miles. So it never seemed crowded or congested. Right away, we come across our first Inca site, Walibamba. The stonework and architecture are amazing. 
These villages were built four to five hundred years ago, but many of them look like all they need is a new thatched roof and we could spend the night. Stunning views are at every turn along the trail, and they are sometimes so breathtaking that Flavio reminds us that we should stop walking and hang on to something when we turn from the trail to look. The earth seems to fall away at your feet, revealing stunning vistas of cloud forests and jagged peaks. Mountains stretch forever into the distance from where we stand. Rivers shimmer far below in lush green valleys. Sometimes the trail can be seen far below or stretching up into the clouds ahead. And almost always, the edge of the trail below our feet drops off at a dizzying angle. The first day I was constantly reminding myself to watch every step. No barriers, no ropes, no caution signs or security guards. Just a sheer drop off into the forest and rocks below. Some of the time the trail looks like an intricate landscaping project with perfectly fitting stones laid straight and flat. But then we hit the steps, thousands of them, going up forever and then back down forever until your quadricep muscles are screaming out for mercy. The concept of how much work it would take to build this trail and these cities is more than our minds can comprehend. We're all relieved to make it to camp that first night and enjoy the incredible hospitality of our chef, Carmelo, assisted by the porters. Three or four course meals are served to us in the dining tent each night. We eat like royalty. Beef, chicken, rice, corn and potatoes, hot soup, coca tea, hot chocolate, popcorn and pastries cover the table. Real silverware, aluminum plates and cups, and intricately folded paper napkins adorn each place setting. The food is hot and delicious and we are famished. At first I made a feeble attempt to keep track of how many calories I ate, but quickly gave up and just ate everything in front of me. By the end of the trip I had lost almost eight pounds. Before we arrive at camp our tents have been set up, hot water, soap and towels are waiting by each tent door, and the hikers that have paid an extra fee each have their duffel bag waiting inside their tent ready for the evening. The porters quickly learned who belongs in which tent and would point out our tent to us when we walk into camp. They soon figured out that Elliot and I were usually first into camp each night, so our tent was always the first in line. As soon as the dinner has been devoured, we gather in a circle in the middle of camp. One by one, we introduce ourselves. Some of the porters are quiet and reserved, and some are more talkative. Few of them speak a lot of English, but they all seem very happy to be part of our group. The chef is dressed in his white chef's smock and chef's hat, and is obviously very proud of his position in the hierarchy of the crew. After Carlos, our assistant guide, gives us a first night on the trail pep talk, we all head straight to our sleeping bags and collapse. Day two awaits and it will be the longest, hardest day of the trip. A bright sun peaks above the mountains to greet us on day two. We've been told since the beginning of the trip that today is the most strenuous of the entire trek with two hard uphill climbs. We will tally 4,400 feet of elevation gain today along with an almost equal amount of downhills, just for good measure. If the weather turns wet, as it often does this time of year in Peru, the downhills will be especially challenging. The stocking hats and jackets come off almost immediately as the trail tips up at a steep angle for more than two hours. I quickly learned that staring at the horizon ahead and above is very demoralizing. The steps just go up and up, and there is no relief in sight. Better to focus on the trail 10 to 20 feet ahead and keep grinding away one step at a time. I am struck by the fact that we're moving very slowly, maybe one step per second or so, and yet my breathing and heart rate indicate that I must be running at a pretty fast clip. 
We start the day at around 10,800 feet and climb continuously to 13,800 feet. At these heights, your heart has to work much harder with less oxygen than it would at sea level, and therefore your breathing rate skyrockets to keep your muscles supplied with what they need to keep moving. Neither Elliot nor I have had any ill effects from the altitude so far. The headaches and stomach issues that some people suffer from have mostly left our group alone. Climbing uneven stairs for over two hours in fairly warm and sunny conditions will test our bodies for sure. Our goal is Dead Woman's Pass at 13,800 feet. Our group breaks into smaller groups by attrition, usually in pairs, and we continue to climb, catch our breath, drink our precious water, and then climb some more. No flat sections, no downhills, yet, just a relentless march of thousands of steps for hours at a time. Elliot and I hit the top and drop our packs with relief. We're both carrying all of our own gear, and even though it doesn't approach the weight of the porter's packs, 25 pounds gets heavy after a while. Eventually, we all reach the summit, soaked in sweat and relieved to have made it to the high point of the Inca Trail. We take a long break, eat our snacks, which Carmelo and the porters fix for us each day, and take a lot of photos while we recuperate. Behind us, the trail drops down the way we came and seems even steeper from the top looking back. The small plateau at the top of the pass separates what feels like two different worlds. We put our jackets back on and step over the summit. We are immediately greeted with a huge temperature drop and, yes, rain. The clouds and mist roll up the valley toward us, soaking the smooth stones beneath our feet, making them treacherous and slick. Elliot stays a little distance behind me, no doubt thinking, if he slips, we won't both tumble down the mountain. We are passed by a couple of porters, not ours, carrying gigantic packs. They seem more confident of the footing than the rest of us are, so we don't try to keep up. Visibility is not great, and it looks as if we're descending directly into the clouds below. We keep descending, carefully, knowing that the weather will change eventually. But for now, the heavy mist and rain continue, with a short burst of hail thrown in just for fun. Elliot and I have our rain covers on our backpacks, and we do our best to stay as warm and dry as possible. Walking downhill on imperfect stone steps for more than half an hour is difficult and challenging. It's easy to lose your focus occasionally, and that's a real bad idea when you're tired and going down very steep terrain, so I'm trying to stay sharp and watch my step. Lunch will be a wet affair today, but everyone's happy to get a break and get something to eat. The amount of calories we burn at this altitude doing this much work is tremendous, and we are more than happy to sit in the mostly dry dining tent for some much needed fuel. When lunch is over, the trail turns upward again, climbing to 13,100 feet. As we climb, we see a lake below us. Elliot is right behind me with his long legs keeping a steady rhythm going. In this case, slow and steady is really the only choice we have. The terrain changes by the minute. Huge boulders straddle the trail, and then it rises up again. One moment we're crossing a very rickety bridge as we enter the cloud forest, and the next we're negotiating a tight corner on a narrow, slick section of trail, trying not to think about how far down we would fall if our feet slipped. Eventually, we fall into a rhythm that eats up the miles and the hours. Late in the afternoon, Elliot and I reach a signpost where the trail splits, one section heads up an impossibly steep stairway, and the other plunges deeper into the wet, shrouded cloud forest below. None of the rest of our group has arrived at this point, so we need to decide which way to go. Another hiker from South Africa, as I learned later, says it's too foggy at the top of the stairs to see the Inca site there. He suggests we go down towards camp. A porter passes us and says we should go up. But then 
he proceeds to go down as well. We go down, hoping we're not missing something important. We know we're getting close to camp, so we keep plugging away through the mist. The trees are draped with moss and strange flowers and vegetation. Occasionally, a small stream or waterfall bursts out of the hillside, and it looks so cool and clear that I'm tempted to take a sip. The porters fill their water bottles at these little springs all the time, but I know they're used to the water here and that it would be a very big mistake and make me very sick. So I stick to the tepid but clean water in my water bottle. Finally, we turn a corner and burst into camp. Twenty feet back up the trail, there was no sign we were this close. And suddenly, here it is. Cha Qui Cocha. We see our group of busy porters in their bright red outfits, scurrying around, setting up tents and sorting gear. We are first into camp, so it gives us a chance to watch the porters at work. As I look around, there are other campsites next to us peeking through the fog. I spot a domesticated pair of llamas checking out our campsite as well. They seem fairly tame, but aren't in a big hurry to come too close. Elliot gets as close as possible to grab some photos, along with a shot of some fresh llama droppings. One of the hazards of the Inca Trail, I guess. The porters let us know that our tent is ready. They have duffel bags for the other group members lying on a tarp as they get ready to start supper and get all of us situated. The bathroom facilities consist of squat toilets, a rare treat, with running water, and are situated on a ridge that looks out over what might be a spectacular view if the weather clears tomorrow. Once everyone makes camp, it's time to head for the dining tent for another wonderful meal prepared by Chef Carmelo and his helpers. Many of us are struggling to stay awake and upright through the hour or more long meal and need no convincing to head for the comfort of our tents and sleeping bags. Day two is over and it was as grueling as advertised. Everything we were wearing is wet but at this point we just want to sleep. We've learned that if you wear your damp clothes in your sleeping bag at night by morning, they'll be fairly dry. Doesn't sound too comfortable, but when you're this exhausted, you hardly even notice. It's a crisp, clear morning. The temperature feels like 40 degrees or less. I'm standing on the edge of the plateau that our campsite sits on, looking out towards the snow-covered peaks of the Andes Mountains. It is utterly breathtaking. I do a slow 360 degree turn featuring our lovely latrine, some neighborhood campsites and our bright red tents further back. Then back around to that view again. It's one of those sites that you know you can't capture on film, but I hope it will come close. Some porters are up and about getting ready for day three of our trek. I'm up this early not so much because I woke up anxious and excited to greet a new day, but because I just couldn't stand laying there on the hard ground, wide awake, hips and shoulders aching, needing to go to the bathroom for one more minute. Elliot and I are both looking forward to our little warm beds back at the Ninos Hotel in Cusco. After a quick breakfast, we have some backtracking to do. We discussed it last night and decided we need to make a fast trip back to the Inca site we missed, Sayac Marca. Our reasoning is, we didn't come 8,500 miles to miss anything. We came to see everything we can. So, we travel light, leaving our packs at camp, and then speed hike our way back up the hill to the impossibly steep stairway leading up to Sayac Marca. We know this will put us behind the rest of the group, but our pace is faster than most hikers, so we're confident we can make our side trip, race back to camp, grab our packs before the porters have picked up the campsite, and get back on schedule by lunchtime. When we reach the site, we are not disappointed. 
After getting there in about 12 minutes or so, we find a clear view of the valley below, with the snow-capped mountains miles away in the distance. After following Elliot up to a higher vantage point, I get a clear picture of the layout of this site. Below me is a long, curved wall with many windows built in. The curved shape is unusual for Inca construction and is usually reserved for special structures or special rooms. This could be a sun temple, where the rising sun shines in through different windows depending on the time of day and the season. Or the wall could be defensive in nature, with the windows being a perfect way to see the valley below and warn others of attack or approach by friends or foe. It's a wonderful sight, and we're very glad we took the time to come back. Now we need to push back to camp and get back on schedule. We travel quickly but carefully down the trail back to Camp 2. In no time at all, we're back at camp, throwing on our packs and heading down the trail. Elliot and I have both gotten stronger as the trip progresses, and we can push ourselves very hard when we need to. I'm guessing this will come in handy tomorrow when we have permits to climb the mountain standing above Machu Picchu called Huayna Picchu. I'm sure the rest of our group has felt this change in fitness too, and there is rarely any complaining about sore muscles or aches and pains, a few mild headaches, and of course, nobody's thrilled about going four days without a shower. Otherwise, the mood is always excited, optimistic, and energized. Like I said, an amazing group of people. By mid-morning, we're back with our group, relishing this last day of hiking. Today is all up and down with dense underbrush and eye-dropping views at every turn. Lunch break takes place on a ridge with a huge granite boulder perched on top. We take another group shot with porters and everyone together. We're all feeling good today because day three is a shorter day with more time in camp this evening. We'll need the extra rest because Flavio tells us we'll be leaving camp tomorrow at 3.30. A.M. The day rolls on as we go through a series of Inca sites. Names like Concha Marca, Fuyu Pata Marca, Intipata, and Huayna Huayna. Fuyu Pata Marca is not only fun to pronounce, it is built like a fortress, clinging to the sheer mountain walls around it. Wide, tall terraces are its trademark. In the background, we see Machu Picchu Mountain. The city itself lies hidden on the other side, but we're getting closer. Below us, we see the Urubamba River, which winds its way through these mountains and ends up at the foot of Machu Picchu Mountain. It stretches off into the distant valley and seems to taunt us with its presence. So near, but still miles and miles to go. I can't help but think, Give me a kayak in a few hours and boom, I'll be right below Machu Picchu. But no, we're doing it the hard way. In my mind, it's the one true way to create this amazing adventure. Travel the Inca Trail on foot, climb the stairs and put up with the sunburn and the insects and the unpredictable weather. Earn your ticket to Machu Picchu. Absorb every tough and exhilarating moment. Wainiewena. The winding, undulating trail opens out onto one of the most impressive vistas I have ever seen. Falling down the mountain like a set of Class 5 rapids are dozens of perfectly curved and angled terraces. The view literally takes your breath away. First at the top, looking down, and then climbing hundreds of big steps to get back up. The perfectly manicured grass, courtesy of domesticated llamas, we're told, is in stark contrast to the jungle around us. The slope is easily 45 to 50 percent on this hillside. Walking down the stairs is an exercise in panic control and patience, and walking back up is an exercise in, well, exercise. All of these sites are marvels of engineering architecture, and human will. How could they have been built? How was it even possible? 
Even today, it would be a huge challenge, let alone 500 or more years ago, with no tools, cranes, forklifts, or computers. The expanse and enormity of what we are seeing is truly beyond words. The sun is still above the horizon when we reach our final campsite. 3.30 a.m. promises to be upon us very quickly. So once our tipping ceremony has taken place outside the dining tent, we crawl into our own safe little tents for some much-needed rest. Tomorrow is the day we've all been waiting for, and, much like children on Christmas Eve, we are filled with nearly unbearable anticipation. It's cold and very dark, and early, about 3.45 or so. Our group is seated together, waiting for the ranger to open the gate. The closed gate is essentially the entrance to what, in the USA, we would call Machu Picchu National Park. The gate is locked and won't be open till 5 a.m., and our group is, gloriously, proudly, first in line. And here we sit for about an hour or more, waiting for the gate to open. When it finally does, we're ready, and we nearly run to keep up with Carlos. Eventually, we settle into a nice, brisk pace and keep moving through the early morning mist. Carlos does not need to urge us on. We're all excited and anxious to see the hidden treasure ahead of us. So here we are, back where our story began following Carlos, and waiting. Will this be the corner where it reveals itself? Is this the clearing in the trees? Is this the magic spot? But the reality is, we're looking down on Machu Picchu and seeing only clouds and fog. We're heading for the sun gate, where we will be directly above the city, with the best chance for a spectacular view. Along the way, we pause, catch up, and take pictures of the fog and the mist below us. The good news is it's warming up, so the jackets are coming off. The rising temperature indicates that we may have a nice day ahead, even though it feels damp and gloomy now. On our way towards the sun gate, we must conquer yet another physical challenge, a set of brutal steps that go straight up for ten minutes or so. Carlos informs us that the locals call these steps the Gringo Killers. Uneven, terribly steep, and, as always, relentless. Just one last chance to go into some serious oxygen debt before we arrive at Machu Picchu. When we reach the sun gate, the sun has not yet appeared, and the clouds have not lifted. We catch our breath and eat our morning snacks, getting ready for the last stretch of trail. From here, it really is all downhill. We meet tourists who took the train to Machu Picchu as they walk back up the hill to the sun gate to see the view from there. We decide not to spoil their day by telling them there isn't really much to see from there. Several groups that were behind us when the day started at the entrance gate now catch up at the sun gate. The tourists from the train, plus these other groups, make it feel a little crowded for the first time in four days. As we descend for the last time, the trail is well used and very impressive in structure. A wide, even stone trail beneath our feet with a massive seven to eight foot wall on our left. Carlos leads us towards our goal and we keep watching the sky, hoping for the sun to peek through. Eventually, we come to an area where more people are gathered and we use this moment to regroup, grab another group shot, and get ready for the walk with Flavio down to the official Machu Picchu entry point. It is complete with ticket station, bus terminal, and cafe. We must wait here for official documents to be inspected, stamped, and dispersed before we head into the city and start our tour. It is mid-morning by now. And thankfully, the clouds and fog have lifted. It is a perfect day. 
You can't really get a look at the city until you follow the path from the ticket booth area and wind around some stone walls and stairways until there it is. Machu Picchu spreads out before us like a banquet feast and we can finally see what we've been waiting for, one of the seven wonders of the world. It is breathtaking and my senses are flooded with the enormity and perfection of this five square mile creation. Over 200 buildings are organized in rows and groups, each with a special function and meaning. The buildings seem to mimic the geography of the steep hillside they cling to. Machu Picchu Mountain on one side and the larger Huayna Mountain on the other. I try to imagine as I stand there on a well-worn terrace, my knees and legs slightly wobbly, what Hiram Bingham saw when he first laid eyes on this place in 1911. Upon his return to Yale, he reported to National Geographic his first impressions, and I quote, Surprise followed surprise until we came to the realization that we were in the midst of as wonderful a ruins as any ever found in Peru. Suddenly, we found ourselves in the midst of a jungle-covered maze of small and large walls, the ruins of buildings made of blocks of white granite, most carefully cut and beautifully fitted together without cement." End quote. His view was compromised by centuries of creeping jungle and overgrowth, but ours was completely unobstructed and almost shocking. How could this have been created? What was its purpose? Flavio reminds us that the city was ordered to be built by the ruler of the Inca Empire, Pachacuti, in the mid-15th century. Archaeologists believe that it was abandoned about 100 years later. No one knows why. Many of these questions will never be answered, but suffice it to say that our first impression was one of sheer stunned awe. We shake off the gee whiz feeling of our initial view and Ellie and I begin to explore as much as we can. There are so many buildings, terraces and stairways, it would be easy to get mixed up. You can't really get lost in Machu Picchu because you can see nearly the entire city from almost everywhere. But it can be difficult to find your way from where you are to where you want to be. In what could be described as a small courtyard, we see a single tree with one of the local llamas at rest on the ground. As with many of the Inca sites, the llamas are in charge of mowing the lawn. We follow Flavio from one area of the site to another, where he explains what certain buildings were for and how historians think the Inca culture functioned. We stop and look down on the vast system of terraces and marvel at the construction and beauty of this place. It seems almost unreal to actually be here, seeing it firsthand. The site has been designated one of the best preserved pre-Columbian ruins in the world. More stairs, of course, as we climb up to the area below the Sun Temple. An intricate chamber has been carved out of the solid stone. It feels like a very sacred place. A series of steps or ledges has been shaped, which no one seems to know the true purpose of. Could sacrifices have taken place here? Like many of the walls and structures, it is built directly into the earth stone and has stood the test of time for centuries. And then we find one very special wall, a massively long and impossibly straight wall built with such precision that a fine needle would not fit between the stones. It is said that this type of mortar-free stonework was reserved only for the highest priests or royalty. There is an intricately designed doorway in this same structure. The immense amount of work to shape and move these stones, with laser straight lines and joints, is truly unfathomable. When you sight down the seams of these walls, they are simply perfect. No machine could make them more level, straight, or true. Elliot and I are scheduled to climb 
Huaynapichu Mountain in just a few minutes, and we're starting to worry we'll miss our start time. Flavio is calm and reassuring and tells us, of course, that it will be fine. We have one last official duty before splitting up to explore, and then catching a bus down to the hairpin road to Aguas Caliente, the town at the base of the mountain. We need to present Flavio and Carlos their gifts of tips from our group. As elder statesman of the team, I'm elected to do the honors. Afterwards, there are hugs and handshakes all around for our wonderful guides. We quickly make our way to the entrance to Huaynapichu Mountain, say goodbye to Carlos, and get ready for the downright treacherous climb of 63 stories to the top of Huaynapichu Mountain. It towers above the city like a protective guardian or soldier. Its slopes are nearly vertical in many places, and the only way up are the intricate stairways and trails built by the Incas centuries ago. At many points, the stairway feels more like a ladder. I get the thumbs up from Elliot, indicating the GoPro video camera is recording, and away we go. We have a certain sense of urgency on the climb since we don't want to miss a bus that takes us to the train station in Aguas Caliente for our return trip to Cusco. So our pace is quick and strong. We've had four days of practice, so we feel confident in our climbing abilities. We left our packs at the luggage checking station by the ticket booth, so we're feeling unencumbered and light and free as we work our way up the stairs and trails being careful to stay focused and alert. We've been told that several people fall to their death each year on this mountain, so safety is foremost in our minds. The trail starts out tame enough, and for a minute or so we get to set our rhythm and catch our breath, but it quickly starts up. I'm impressed with how my son moves so smoothly and safely on the uneven steps and rocks, and try to keep pace with him while looking off the trail occasionally to soak up the views. We go up, then down again, then up again, of course, but mostly up. Something new has made an appearance. Guardrails, or in this case, heavy cables. They show up on corners and inclines that are the most dangerous, or have the sketchiest footing. They seem to be there to help you climb, but not necessarily to keep you from falling. I decide not to dwell on this thought, and we keep climbing. Climbing a lot, descending a little, that's the pattern we establish, until it's pretty much all straight up. We pass a lot of people along the way, but it's a small crowd on this leg of the journey. Only 200 permits per day are issued for the climb, and Elliot managed to get us signed up early enough to ensure a spot. We are the only two of our group making this climb today and many others have said that they regret not getting a permit. The sign at the entrance to Huaynapichu said to allow two hours for the trip up, picture taking, and the trip down. We're not racing, but as I said, we're concerned about catching our bus, so we plan to do it much faster than that. As we reach the top, I glance at my watch, about 30 minutes. The first thing that pops into my head as we get to the very highest point is good grief. The summit of Huaynapichu is about the size of a typical living room. It's a series of huge slabs of white granite stacked on each other like collapsed cement walls after an earthquake. Everything is slanted and slick. There are teenagers in tight jeans and tank tops sitting on the edge of the precipice leaning back over the sheer drop behind them, taking selfies on their cell phones. My stomach is in a tight knot as I try not to watch. Elliot and I scramble around to find some place to sit. Standing is very difficult, not just because of the slick slanted footing, but because of the sensation of uninterrupted nothingness all around us. Vertigo, maybe. Elliot takes a picture of a young couple perched on a 45 degree slope, and then he and I throw reason off the mountain and climb to the same spot ourselves for what will be one of my favorite pictures of this trip. I move slowly and carefully, 
but I'm more concerned about some knucklehead knocking me off the mountain. There's also a fine layer of granite dust on everything, making it even more slick and dangerous. Others are waiting to tempt fate at the top, so we start looking for the exit. There's a structure just below the summit that we assume is like the coolest lookout ever, so we stop to check it out. Talk about a room with a view. And then it's time to head back down. Most of the descent, once we negotiate some slower traffic, is not for the faint of heart. Sitting and dropping down one step at a time works in the steepest places, especially when there are people right in front of us. Eventually, we get ahead of most of the slower, some might say smarter, hikers, and Elliot hits the gas. There are big drops, uneven steps, and even a few loose rocks, but we set a good pace and work our way through the treacherous twists and turns at a pretty fast clip. Behind us is a young man from either Australia or New Zealand, he doesn't say enough for me to know for sure, who likes our pace and asks if he can tag along. The three of us continue to make good time down the mountain, and before long, actually about 13 minutes, we're back to the small hut where we have to sign out to make sure everyone made it the round trip. We're pretty out of breath and sweaty, but we made really good time. Now we just need to get from one side of Machu Picchu to the other, no small task, and get ready to catch the bus. What a view we had. Looking down on the site gave us such an incredible perspective on the size and scope of Machu Picchu. We work our way through the maze of terraces and stairways that make up Machu Picchu and get to the main entrance in time to get our checked backpacks and make our way to the long line waiting for the buses to Aguas Caliente. It's a steep, crazy trip down a switchback road in our bus. It appears to be way too many buses on not nearly enough road. Once safely on the streets of town, we make our way to the restaurant where we will meet with the rest of the group. Elliot gets his chance to try the guinea pig, or qui. I'm reminded of what my Uncle Harry used to say when he would leer over us at the dinner table when I was a kid. Are you going to eat that, or have ya? We all head for the train depot and enjoy comfortable seats and scenic views as we head back towards Cusco. The three hour plus ride makes me stiff and sore, but we're not done yet. It's back on board the Llama Path bus for the final hour to Cusco. By the time Elliot and I get to the Niños Hotel, we have time for a nice hot shower, a quick supper in the restaurant downstairs, and then it's a much anticipated night of sleep in our cozy little beds real mattresses and pillows and blankets. The rest of the trip is all about getting home. The excitement is over and the goal has been accomplished, so you just want to get home safely and quickly. In our case, there was nothing quick about it. A one-hour fog delay in Cusco at 6.30 a.m. meant a 24-hour delay for all of our remaining flights. 25 hours in the Lima airport alone sitting and waiting, walking and waiting, no sleep, no smartphones, and no way of getting home one second sooner. The trip from Cusco to San Francisco ended up taking 47 hours. The next morning I still had to fly back to Omaha and meet my wife Kim for the one hour drive home to Atlantic, Iowa. But nothing could take away from the amazing adventure that Elliot and I had shared. Like all fathers, I love my son very much, and more than ever because of this trip and what we did as a team. But the greatest discovery I made, the fondest memories I will take away from all of this is, I really like the man my son has become. I wish I could spend more time with him. When our children are small, they don't need another friend, they need a parent. But when they become adults, we all want to make that connection with our kids and become their friend and their parent. 
So I have to say thank you to my son, my friend, Elliot. Thank you for the idea, for all your hard work and planning, and most of all, for the incredible adventure we shared. It truly was the trip of a lifetime, because we did it together. Something hidden. Go and find it. Go and look behind the ranges. Something lost behind the ranges. Lost and waiting for you. Go. Go.